We are grateful to have you here for today's Fighting Hate from Home, which is part of a day of action to confirm Dr. Deborah Lipstadt as the next US Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Today's call will address the importance of advocacy and how you can help push for her confirmation. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers on today's call, Joshua Molina and Rabbi Shira Stutman. Joshua Molina is an actor and activist. He has held starring roles on the Aaron Sorkin television series, Sports Night and The West Wing, as well as on the mega popular Scandal and The Big Bang Theory. He is also the co-creator of the West Wing Weekly podcast. Rabbi Shira Stutman is a nationally known faith-based leader and change maker, most recently as the founding rabbi of Sixth and I Synagogue in Washington, DC. She teaches and speaks nationally on topics including growing welcoming Jewish spiritual communities, building the connective tissues between different types of people, and the current American Jewish community zeitgeist. Together, Rabbi Shira and Joshua created Chutzpod, a weekly podcast in which they, along with honored guests, bring a Jewish lens to life's toughest questions. We look forward to hearing from them in just a little bit, but to get us started, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome ADL CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt. Thank you so much, Deb, for the kind uh, introduction of our guests. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, I am the CEO of ADL. Yes, I am our sixth national director, but I think most importantly, I was an early guest on Chutzpah, which I think we're going to spend some time talking about that episode. It was a seminal episode for this podcast, and people are still talking about it, so I'm excited to do that. Uh, but before we get to that and our guests, just to kind of set the stage, uh, while I might make jest of some of this, the actual issues are incredibly serious. When I say they're incredibly serious, in the last five years, from 2015 to 2020, we saw a 114% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the United States. These are acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence directed at Jewish institutions and Jewish individuals. But of course, they were acts that were consequential because they, in effect, terrorized our entire community. And we know that there's a straight line, if you will, from Charlottesville to Capitol Hill. And in between, we have memorable moments like the massacre in Pittsburgh or the near massacre in Poway or the stabbing in Jersey, sorry, the stabbing in Muncie, New York, or the shooting in Jersey City, New Jersey, or the rash of assaults and acts of bias in Brooklyn that continue to this very day. And of course, just last May, we had here in this city in New York, as well as Los Angeles and across the country, Jewish people being beaten up in broad daylight. Now in those instances, these were acts of violence perpetrated against Jewish people, overwhelmingly by individuals who are coming out of anti-Israel events. Some might say from the political left. And acts like Poway and Pittsburgh, and certainly Capitol Hill were committed by people who were clearly coming from the far right. And acts like Muncie and acts like Jersey, Jersey City or Colleyville, Texas, were people who were animated by other ideologies, whether it was kind of radical Islam or another kind of religious fanaticism, mentally disturbed people. But all of this has left our community feeling under siege. And as we feel under siege in this country, issues around the world are equally, if not more difficult. Our colleagues in the UK just released a report, a report in the last few weeks reporting a shocking increase of anti-Semitic incidents across Great Britain in 2021. Again, many stimulated by or prompted by the fighting in Gaza. The numbers there have reached record levels. We see the same from France, where again, our counterpart agencies have released data that suggests the acts of over violence and harassment facing the Jewish community in France have reached epidemic levels as well. So there's no question that global anti-Semitism is a problem and in fact, a pervasive one. And there is, while there is no silver bullet, while there is no single strategy that will solve the problem, the reality is, is that advocacy can play a significant role. And there arguably is no more important advocate in the world on this issue than the global envoy 
excuse me, the special envoy to monitor global anti-Semitism, a role that was created at the State Department by President Bush, which has been uh, filled continuously until this moment. And the nominee, Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, a professor from Emory University, her nomination has been held up and that's what brings us together here today. Now I'll say that ADL in recent years, particularly after President Biden was inaugurated, pushed to make that special envoy position an ambassador level role. We did that because we thought it was critical that this level, this issue get the level of attention that it merited. And indeed we were successful in that advocacy. President Biden opted to take that job from a staff level job to an ambassadorial level position. So we were gratified by his recognition of its significance. Unfortunately, the role now requires a Senate confirmation process, which in ordinary times wouldn't be much ado, but in this time it is when everything has become so politicized, when Congress is paralyzed by a kind of partisan gridlock. And even the simplest things, the most common sense issues become complicated political firefights. So while we applauded the nomination of Dr. Lipstadt, and when I say we did, I think almost all of our friends and allies in the Jewish community did the same. Professor Lipstadt's scholarship is, is you know, without dispute, incredibly impressive. She's an esteemed scholar of the Holocaust. She's fought Holocaust deniers in public spaces most significantly and perhaps dramatically in a British court in a libel case against notorious Holocaust revisionist David Irving that was made into a successful movie that actually doesn't feature Josh Molina, but is still quite good, um, called Denial. And yet it's taken six months for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to hold even scheduled Professor Lipstadt's hearing. It finally happened last week. And while the hearing went well and Dr. Lipstadt had much bipartisan support. There's at least one senator on the committee who is still vocally opposed to her nomination and working to delay a vote at a time when he, like other senators, like other elected officials on both sides of the aisle, claim to be, uh, claim to be against anti-Semitism, claim to be in alignment with and in support of the Jewish people. So now for us at ADL, the goal is to get Professor Lipstadt voted out of committee so that she can be confirmed by the whole Senate. And we think that can't happen soon enough. So for weeks, we've asked you to contact your senators. And I know many ADL leaders around the country have been publishing op-eds. I've seen them in Florida, in Iowa, in Utah, in Connecticut, urging your senators to confirm Dr. Lipstadt. I know some of you have even sent letters to the editor to drive attention on this issue. But today we're gonna focus on why volunteer action is so important and how you personally can make a difference. Um, you know, sometimes I know it can feel like one call, if you will, or, or one letter or one email might not matter, but the actions of professional staff or of me speaking for ADL, they're not sufficient. You know, you think that we might be able to get it done ourselves, but that just isn't true. The most important people to elected officials are the constituents who live in their district, are the voters, who support them in the polls or come out against them as it were. That's why your voice matters so much. That's why we wanna ask each of you to call and write your elected officials. And that's why we're bringing you together in person when we can, but virtually as well to meet those elected officials, whether that's in DC or in state capitals across the country, because it's literally someone's job in a congressional office to keep track of those calls, to count and respond to those emails and to inform the member what topics their constituents are reaching out about. How many calls came in? How many emails landed in the inbox? How many mentions were there in a local paper? You can be sure that when those op-eds were published by ADL about how many calls and how many emails, you know, that the senators, whether it was Senator Mike Lee in Utah or Senator Marco Rubio in Florida or Senator Ted Cruz in Texas, or Senator Mitt Romney in Utah, those senators had the hard copy of the newspaper put in front of them with the letter to the editor. Those senators learned that Senator Cruz received 70 plus calls last week in support of Dr. Lipstadt's nomination. So you can be sure 
as the confirmation hearing concluded last week, that those senators knew that ADL was pushing for Professor Lipset to get a vote and urging them specifically to support her nomination. So today we're gonna to talk about advocacy, what our Jewish tradition teaches us and what it demands of us. And we're gonna talk about the Jewish history of advocacy and then we'll engage in some advocacy together because this is not one of those Zooms where you get to watch and multitask, and do other things. We're gonna work on this together right here, right now. So I'm super excited to welcome our special guests, Josh Molina and Rabbi Shira Stutman to Fighting Hate From Home. I know both of them have important insights to share about why we must be engaged and informed and confident advocates. So let me welcome them to the show, as it were. Welcome, Josh, and welcome, Rabbi Shira. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's, it's great to be here, although that was quite a sobering opening. <laughs> Yeah, well, the data is, you know, undeniably daunting. And the numbers are different than we've seen before. So let's start off by talking a little bit about anti-Semitism. Josh, maybe we can start with you. How has anti-Semitism played out in, in your life, or maybe even in your industry, if you've seen it, as a performer who doesn't hide his Jewishness? Yeah, well, I mean... I don't want to misrepresent myself and say that I've been a victim, a professional victim of anti-Semitism. I think my particular pet peeve, what gets under my skin and what I tend to notice is when uh, certain people who engage in anti-Semitism are nonetheless uplifted, glorified, employed by the industry. I wrote a piece about Mel Gibson recently in The Atlantic because uh, I feel that this is a bad time uh, for prominent anti-Semites like Mel Gibson uh, to be in the headlines every day for this new job and taking over the, uh, uh, you know, the Lethal Weapon 5 franchise from Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, a studio that was founded by Jews. I mean, I, it's just a time uh, when if you ever had any impulse to get involved, to open your mouth, to act. I mean, what you said was inspiring to me. I loved my intro, but my shoulders went up a little bit when I was described as an activist because I don't feel that uh, I'm an accomplished, uh, I'm not accomplished in that field. But what, what you said inspired me and reminded me that to be an activist, you have to act. That's all, you know, uh, you have to pick up the phone be willing to call your senator. You have to be willing to write an email. I see the chat box uh, just on this Zoom alone. It's filled with activists. These are people who have something to say. They're not afraid to say it. We don't all, even all have to agree with each other. Um, but, but being an activist is simply being willing to act on that in which, uh, which you believe in. I, I love the way you laid that out, Josh. And I mean, I think it's really important. While there may be professional activists, as it were, I think all of us have the capacity for activism in some way. And I think you do exemplify that. Um, so I appreciate your, your leadership. And Rabbi Shear, if I could turn to you, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've been at the helm at Six and I for you know, more than a decade. And I wonder how you've seen anti-Semitism you know, play out. But I also wanna ask you about this notion of activism and what the Torah commands us to do as Jews in terms of activism. So I'd love for you to take this either direction that you might like. Yeah, I also think Josh, what you just said is just, is so beautiful. Like I wanna roll my eyes when you say that you're not an activist, right? Because there's so much that you've done in this world. And so for all the people feeling imposter syndrome, like that, that, only, that only benefits our enemies, you know, it doesn't help us. So, um, so look, as I know, as I'm sure you know, Jonathan, like I, I can almost open almost like any book behind me, almost, and like point at a page, and there would be a line about activism, right? Like right. The, Judaism is to a certain extent, it's a, it's an activist tradition. We do, and even though, like when we think of Jews, we think of Shabbat or keeping kosher, activism is arguably just as much a part of what it means to be Jewish as any of those other rituals, um, and we, it's like um, you can't have one without the other. Um, you know, I was thinking about um, the, the holiday, the next holiday that's coming up, which is, as 
as we all know, is Purim. It's like the most important holiday on the calendar, in my humble opinion. And I think about that line when Mordechai says to Esther, it's, he says, perhaps it was just for this moment that you have been created. Hmm. And, um, and I think how that sort of connects to what Josh was just saying before, that when we say, oh, I am not important, I am just a nothing, or that's not what Josh said. So forgive me, Josh, for hyperbolizing what you said. Like what we are sort of abdicating and is perhaps for this moment that we were created, perhaps for this moment, there's almost a thousand people on the Zoom right now getting ready to be activists. Perhaps for this moment, the ADL is getting ready to help push forward the, I almost said the ordination of Deborah Lipstadt, the, the confirmation of Deborah Lipstadt. Like for this moment, we have all been created um, and we're all activists. That's really beautiful. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of us talk about this as if to kun olam, but it sounds almost ephemeral. But the idea of repairing the world through a kind of act is so powerful, Rabbi Shear, what you're talking about. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Like, I think sometimes Jews can just, we can think that like Jewish ideas are the beginning and end of what it means to, to be Jewishly involved. But Jewish ideas are, are, are the beginning. Right, that we're supposed to have the ideas, have the conversations, and then do something about them. Um, and doing something about them is what actually can sort of bend the arc in a whole new direction. Yeah, you know, I worked for President Obama before this job, and he used to often quote King, who I think was quoting some other Protestant theologian, you know, who said that uh, the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. And one of the things that I think I've learned on this job is that's actually wrong. The moral arc of the universe doesn't bend toward justice unless you reach up and grab it and bend it yourselves, you know? We need to do that. We can't think that life or democracy are spectator sports. We need to roll up our sleeves and engage in the process. I really believe in that. I, so, and I'd love whether it's Josh or Rabbi Shira, like maybe you could share an example of activism in your life. I mean, beyond the Jewish stuff, or maybe inspired by our Jewish values, the moment where you were engaged on an issue that's important to you, you know, and how these things manifested. Either of you could feel free. Well, to I, I'll tell briefly <clears throat> an anecdote where I learned that just showing up can be activism and wh where I even finally crossed the line. I used to have a real <clears throat> hesitance to share my views publicly because I, I had sort of disdain for actors who are like, who think their opinion should be any more important than anyone else's simply because they're actors. But then through this anecdote, I sort of learned that sometimes there's an, uh, uh, an opportunity and maybe even a responsibility. And it started with a, um, in 2001, I was invited to a, an, a rally organized by the Jewish Federation of Los Angeles to support Israel and simply to make the uh, statement, Israel has a right to exist, which I did not find a controversial statement at the time, nor do I now. It was apolitical. It wasn't any endorsement of the Israeli government or any policy of the Israeli government. I, I have my own criticisms of the Israeli government, as I do of the US government, both countries I love. But I was happy to participate, sit on the, the celebrity dais. I didn't quite feel I deserved it, but they called. So right. I showed up. <clears throat> right. I don't consider myself a celebrity now. I certainly wasn't one in 2001, and this was made clear when the celebrity sign-in people asked me who I was. <laughs> I said, I, I swear I've been invited. Uh, but when the celebrity sign-in people ask you to spell your name and pronounce it twice, uh -huh. um, you're not a celebrity. Uh, I was not offended, but I was surprised when I then discovered that there were only about two other people. It was then Mayor Han of Los Angeles. There was a musician that I was a fan of, but we, this was not Oscar night. And I, I commented afterwards to the Federation people. I said, well, where were the actual Jewish celebrities? They didn't even know who I was when I signed in. And uh, she said, oh, if it has to do with Israel, nobody will show up. Uh, and I was really struck by that. And it, it made real to me the truism that showing up is itself uh, it can be an act of defiance, it can be an act of uh, a statement of values, and that, that has been the impetus to me to get over my uh, natural hesitance or shyness uh, and to act uh, a little more boldly. That's good for you. It's great. Thank you. Um, you know, Rabbi Shear, I think I'd love for you to respond and I'll also just to build on what Josh said. I mean, we often find that Jewish people in public stations, if you will, 
feel hesitant in some ways to speak out about their Jewish values or to speak out about their Zionism or to speak out about these things in a Jewish way. They don't have a problem speaking out for other causes, but it's when their Jewish identity is invoked that it becomes complicated. How do we sort, how do you sort through that? Oh, oh that's such a good question. And I think there are so many pieces of data that like go into sort of that question. First of all, I, I do think, and this is something we talked about in the podcast last week, that it's actually quite difficult to understand how anti-Semitism functions. Yeah. And you know, because Jews are relatively, as, as minorities go in America, are relatively wealthy as a group, relatively educated as a group, relatively powerful as a group, it can be hard because we get into sort of com comparisons of hatreds. And so I think one reason people don't, don't speak up is because they actually don't understand how, and they feel like they don't have a right somehow to speak up. And that not having a right connects to the other reason I think people don't speak up. If you're asking me um, to speak really honestly, I, I think there's a lot of internalized anti-Semitism. I think that we are trained as Jews to sort of, to say no one's gonna take care of us, but the Jews, only the Jews take care of the Jews. And therefore, you know, when someone says something to us, we either shrink away from it, right? Because we don't actually believe they can be helpful to us and that they'll change, right? They're always gonna be the same or enemies. Um, so we shrink away from it or we're too nervous to say something ourselves. You know, and I think all of this connects somehow um, also to the Zionist question, which you brought up, which is talking about Israel and is, 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 is arguably even more complicated than understanding anti-Semitism. It, it, it is, and for us to pretend that it's not is itself a uh, problematic. And so I just think that we, um, sometimes we get smaller when we need to get larger. It's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, I know that like when I was growing up, I was checked by my parents, uh, like keep your head down. Don't yeah. say anything. Yeah. <laughs> like don't talk in the cab about being Jewish. Yeah. Like you don't need any, nobody needs to know. Like just, just shh, you know, and this was, I don't know. I think there's a collect, I think all of our kind of collective DNA is imprinted with this trauma, right? Yeah. And I don't think it um, dissipates anytime soon. Yeah. I think that my grandmother, when she was so upset when Joe Lieberman was nominated as a vice presidential candidate, right. she said, you know, be quiet be quiet. But then part of the way anti-Semitism works, of course, is that Jews are allowed to rise to certain levels of power so that we can, so people think that we are in power so that we can then be blamed when something goes wrong. And so it, it's all, everything is so connected and so complicated. Um, yeah. Yeah, these are very hard things. And, you know, I think in terms of complexity, you're talking about Josh, you come back to the entertainment industry where there are, I mean, Jewish people, in a way, if you, to, to kind of use a term, Jewish refugees from the East Coast essentially founded many of the institutions that we think of today as Hollywood, right? There are Jewish people in so many roles in front of the camera, behind the scenes, and yet this conundrum you're talking about that you saw play out in LA seems right, where so many of them are just not, you know, that story about the Hollywood Museum, which you probably saw, seems to exemplify this. Are you familiar with that situation? Maybe you can- Yeah, yeah I've read about it. I have not been there. <clears throat> I mean, it's really interesting because I just think a lot of, it's, it's hard to understand how do we square these things, right? An industry that's so Jewish, that seems almost in denial of some kind about it's Jewish, Jewishness. Yeah, I think part of it is keep your head down. And right. that's not, uh, that doesn't work. That right. is uh, a historically uh, not a successful strategy. And uh, I think that that's why it's important to have get togethers like this and webinars. And uh, I'm as, as excited here to share my thoughts as I am to learn what can I do? You know, I, I, I am all for uh, Deborah Lipsatz being confirmed. I, but I, but I do, I need guidance like the average person. And, right. and I'm, I'm excited to learn and to act on it. And, and what do I do? You know, I live in California. My senators are, you know, are on board. My representatives on board. What do you do beyond your own zip code? I, I'm, I'm interested to learn. That's a great question that we can talk about. Um, and so I think on this issue of like being willing to learn, you know, as we see anti-Semitism on the rise, as we see extremism kind of normalizing, as we see a sort of illiberalism intensifying at home and around the world, 
I mean, as Jewish, look, I think both of you, through your previous work, now through the podcast, you're Jewish communal leaders or community leaders, maybe a better way of putting it. So I wonder what advice you might have for people watching who are seeking, you know, to find a sense of empowerment in this moment when the issues seem great. I mean, what can we learn from our lives or Rabbi Shira from Torah to give us some degree of inspiration and hope in these moments? Josh, you want me to start that one? <laughs> yes, I mean, I was just gonna throw in one thing because it hops on something you said earlier. <clears throat> we often, I think, slightly mistranslate the mitzvot, uh, uh, which really literally means commandments uh, as acts of, uh, kindness or acts of goodness, you know, it would be mitzvah if you did that. And I think it's important for us to remember that the mitzvah are commandments. So if you're trying to live a substantive Jewish life, it's not just nice stuff that is suggested in the Torah. Tikkun olam, helping to repair the world, advocating for ourselves and improving our own lives and going beyond our community to help is considered part of our obligation. So I think the first thing to do is just to, to realize this is high stakes and, and and it's incumbent upon us to get involved. And now, Rabbi. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're right, and I love. I, He's drashing. I love it too. I know it's like it's such good Torah. Maybe right. I should talk about Hollywood now. Um, <laughs> so, I'm thinking about all that research and about um, you know if you have ten dollars to spend that buying something for yourself, the amount of joy you get from buying something for yourself versus the amount of joy you get by giving that $10 to someone in need, you actually get a lot more joy by giving the money to someone in need than buying something for yourself. Mm. And I do think that one way to find encouragement in this moment that really does sometimes feel like things are getting worse rather than better is actually to do the work right, to work the steps as it were, to actually call your, um, to actually call your senators, call your representatives, to actually, when someone says something that feels a little hurtful to you, to actually respond to it and to engage in the difficult conversations and not to be scared, to read perhaps a book like the one sitting right behind you, Jonathan, you know, it could, yes. I mean, Let's just say, for instance, right, to continue to read about anti-Semitism, yeah. to not sort of turtle yourself in your shell and just say, well, this just shows everyone hates the Jews, but instead to like give it away, use your energy. And my guess is for every senator that you call, you will actually feel better rather than worse about the world. Here, 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 here. Well, look, there are so many good questions. I can see them coming. So I want to give it over to, uh, to Deb, but I just will say one quick thing. You know, look at ADL, we think about, we don't really care how people vote, we care what you value. We think Deborah Lipstadt's nomination is not about politics, it's about principles. I was proud when I got here that we worked with Ira Foreman, who had been the special envoy in the Obama administration. And then we sought the confirmation of Elon Carr by this role the, and worked closely with him when he was in the Trump administration as we work closely with Professor Lipset, when she benefits, I hope, from not just uh, getting voted on a committee, but getting voted on and confirmed by the whole Senate. So I wanna keep everyone in mind, whether you're watching today and you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent, right? This isn't about politics, it's about the principle of standing up against anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. So, so with that said, Deb, I wanna pass it to you so we can start to get into some of the really good questions I see. All right, great. All right, so first and foremost, I'm going to address the most popular questions that have popped up. So many folks are asking, who is the senator blocking the confirmation? So that's Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, who sits on the Foreign Relations Committee. So if you live in Wisconsin, we need you to call Senator Johnson with a special message. Please text, follow me now, and we're gonna drop this in the chat, I think, no block, N-O-B-L-O-C-K, to the number 52886, and that will send you instructions. Uh, and it was also noted that people should call even supportive senators for the reason that Jonathan explained earlier, it gets tracked and you can thank them. And it is best to call your own elected officials because simply they, they care the most about their constituents who are actually able to vote for them. Uh, and last, people are asking them if it makes sense to do that, the answer is yes, these calls are tracked. Thank them, thank them, thank them. You cannot thank people enough. All right, 
So with that, let us move on to some of the other questions that are popping up in the chat. All right. So first and foremost, this is a really interesting question. And I, I mean, I think all of you can probably lend an opinion here, but Jonathan, I think we'll go to you first. How can we start to anticipate what accusations that are being made of Jews are next? So how can we better prepare for what's coming around the bend? You know, we keep talking about how bad things are, how they keep getting worse. How can we be better prepared? Well, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I will give maybe two thoughts and then share the, 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 share the opportunity with my colleagues to answer. So first of all, I really think we see anti-Semitism. Uh, there's a kind of cyclical nature to it. And there's a set of tropes that tend to repeat themselves. Tropes about Jews and money, Jews and power, uh, deicide, blood libel, uh, you know, delegitimization and so on. So we've tried to really educate ourselves about how these manifest because it, they may be in the context of COVID or next maybe in the context of, I don't know, some other financial crisis or some other issue. So we number one, try to know the historical tropes so we can use them as a means by which to understand what's happening in the, in the present. Um, that's again, planful, but a bit reactive. And then secondly, like our strategy is a strategy like safety through security and safety through solidarity. Safety through security means we try to do analysis up front and we do a lot of monitoring so that we can preempt the problems before they manifest, right? And then secondly, we work with synagogues. We have partnerships with the, you know, the reform movement, the conservative movement, Hillel International, a bunch of other Jewish organizations to help them secure their own facilities, secure their own networks, secure their own constituencies and congregations so they can defend or campuses so they can defend themselves against the virus of anti-Semitism. We're trying to build, you know, like strengthen the white blood cells, if you will, of our, of our community. But you can never build walls high enough. You can never lock your network down sufficiently to keep out the bad guys, which are, we also think you need safety through solidarity. Like ultimately on our best day of the year, you know, what, we're 7 million people. I have a country 342 million so the notion that it's all going to work itself out if we're just strong is ridiculous. And keep in mind, Rabbi Charlie in Colleyville, who I was humbled when he thanked ADL, you know, for the work that we did to keep him safe. But I got to be honest with you, he opened his door to that man to give him tea, which I think is a metaphor for how our community responds to the stranger, as we always should. So I think ultimately, no matter how high your walls are, we need to have solidarity with other communities. Again, to, to extend, it's like, it's not that the best defense is a good offense. Sometimes the best defense is good outreach to work with people and to lock arms and find the things that we have in common. So this is our approach. You can never anticipate everything, but if you know your history and can use that to make sense of the present, then you have this dual track process to build safety. I think that's, you know, for us, the, the way that we, we approach it. Thank you, Jonathan. Rabbi Shira, Josh, do you have anything to add to that? How do we respond to these things? How do we anticipate these kinds of attacks? How can we help people to respond to them? I would say that excuse me, as I am not a professional in the field, I tend to be reactive rather than being part of anticipating. And I look to organizations like the ADL to, to be a step ahead. Um, I also, something that Jonathan said, uh, and he said, um, linking arms, we have been good allies as Jews. We have a proud history. It is a point of pride to me that uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel literally linked arms with uh, Martin Luther King marching on Selma, uh, that uh, Jewish philanthropy um, and activism were involved in the creation, the foundation of the NAACP and in the creation of HBCUs. And so one of the things we have to be for ourselves, but I also think we have to get a little bit more demanding that uh, other groups to whom we've been great allies historically, that they're there for us as well. And uh, that's something when the whole um, situation in Colleyville, Texas, that horrible situation was playing out. Uh, you know, for me, I sort of tracked it over social media. I, I, I started saying, you know, I would like to hear more of my Jewish, uh, non-Jewish friends tweeting about this. This is happening. Uh, and I think uh, that's, we can also, we've earned the right 
to demand the allyship of other groups. Here, here. Thank you. Rabbi Shira? I agree. I mean, I think safety through solidarity is, is, is incredibly beautiful. And I think that solidarity is not something that begins and ends, right? We have to continue to stand in solidarity with, with other, um, other vulnerable populations it, um, for a multitude of reasons, most of all, because it's the right thing to do. And also because if we want people to stand in solidarity with us, we, we have to, at the very, very least, return the favor. The other thing I just want to say, just to add, is to remind people in our day-to-day -day lives, we're not talking about in sort of the larger political, God forbid, with Colleyville or sort of the larger political moments. In our day-to-day -day lives, a lot of times when we hear things um, that feel hurtful towards Jews, they're not actually anti-Semitism, as it were. They come more from a place of people not understanding Jews and how they work. You know, in my opinion, I am not speaking for the ADL here in any way, shape or form, but that's a little bit of what happened with Whoopi Goldberg a few weeks ago, right? And so we have to try to understand when people are really coming from a malicious place and when people are coming from a place where they can actually learn something. And then we have to learn how to talk to people about it in a way that they can hear. Yeah, can I just say something about that to build on what Rabbi Shira said? I think, you know, it's really important to know that as Josh said earlier, you know, we have been good allies. The aid, Jewish people helped to, start the NAACP to start the Jewish man ran the NAACP Legal Defense Fund when it spun out from the organization. We've been at the forefront of the movement for marriage equality and for immigration reform and so many other important meaningful social movements of our time. Feminism, right? Gloria Steinem and Stella Abzug and all these amazing leaders. And yet let's just acknowledge like, what is that Rabbi Shira, you're gonna know this, I'm gonna get it wrong, but you are compelled to start the work but not to finish it. What is that? Right. It's not actually, that's interesting. Um, right. Um, what's this? You're compelled to right, begin, but you're not, you're not compelled to finish it. It's from Pirkei Avot, the, the, yeah. the blessings of the sage. That's right. Rabbi Tarfon. Yeah, exactly. So I think this work, so people say to me, why should we do any more for them? What have they done for us? Like, this isn't a quid pro quo. Like, we live in a relational world and we need to realize that this is an ongoing process, that one with a start and an end. And Josh isn't wrong, I think, to say, we want to see our allies speak up, but again, we have to bring them in and work with them to do that, not expect they're gonna do it like a, a back scratching contest, so. Right, and actually the, the saying is, sorry, Jonathan, it took me a second, you are not obligated to finish the work, mm. right? which is, I think is even more important that like, we're just part of a longer process. Anti-Semitism is not gonna end with our lifetimes. I mean, I wish it would, but it's not. And so we, but we are obligated to be a part of it. Here, here. Thank you all. And actually, I, I think you've answered some of the next question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, because I think folks are looking for some specifics, which are, so how do we do that? How do we actually engage with other people and how do we educate them? And what do you think it is that, you know, Josh, to build on what you were mentioning earlier, what do you think it, how do you think we could educate these celebrities about Israel so that they wouldn't be scared to show up, scared to raise their voice? I mean, I have discussions often, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, friends and colleagues on the topic. These are private discussions. People will come to me and say, I have an inclination to support Israel. I feel this way, but what do you respond to this? And I say, first, educate yourself and accept that nothing in this area is black and white. And uh, if you're hearing any kind of monolithic take on either quote unquote side, you should dismiss it immediately and dive into the gray area and understand that these discussions are uncomfortable and are difficult. I mean, this is what I have with my kids too. Um, I think some of us were raised with uh, a very strong particular pro-Israel narrative that obscured some difficult issues. And kids today particularly are too sophisticated, I think, to by that line. And so I think you have to accept, and this is what I say to my friends who are contemporaries as well, that this is not gonna be easy. This is difficult stuff to talk about. There is a lot of nuance involved. Yes, a lot of anti-Israel or um, statements critical of Israel uh, dovetail with anti-Semitism, but no, not all criticism of Israel does. And so, I usually just start with a warning. If you want to get involved in this, 
understand it's going to take time, it's going to take knowledge, and it's going to take an open mind to interact with others about. Yeah, I think that's a really solid answer and a good, I hate to say warning, but a good way to frame that. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? How people can, like, how to actually start creating that change? I mean, I think, you know, it happens one day at a time, one conversation at a time, one interaction at a time. Like when you see hate happen, speak out. You know, we use this heuristic at ADL, speak out, share facts, show strength. But speaking out means whether it happens, you know, at the water cooler, I guess, in the Zoom meeting uh, these days, or, you know, in the locker room or on the face in your Facebook feed. Like there's ways they may seem small, but it's like the starfish in the ocean. Like even the smallest thing builds into something really big. So I think everyone should realize, again, activism doesn't have to be marching on Washington. Activism can be when you hear a, a, an act of bias, a biased comment, interjecting and saying, that's not okay, and let me tell you why. And not just doing it when it's about you, but speaking up for the other, like being an ally, not because you get points for it, but because it's the principal thing to do. And in particular, being an ally, when you see that, even if, even if unintentional, prejudice come from someone on your own team. That means, you know, progressive people should, when they hear someone in their own circles, say something illiberal, call it out. You're a conservative person. You hear someone in your own circle, say something, you know, biased, call it out. Like it means so much more when we have the courage to acknowledge the errors on our own side, really rather than pointing fingers at somebody else. That's an excellent point. So Rabbi Shear Knight, you've, had, you've heard a lot of these answers. I'm sorry to come to you last. I know that's a tough place to be, but what would you like to add? I, I, I cannot agree more with what Jonathan and Josh said. I mean, everything they said, I think is so important, especially the part that Jonathan said about how hard this work is. It, to, to get someone to sort of shift their opinion, to shift the way they see the world is, is one of the hardest things we can do. And so I want to say amen to everything they said. And so to add a few other things, I do think in order to shift opinion, we have to learn a little bit how to listen. Sometimes Jewish trauma because makes us defensive because we are so ready for people not to listen to us and not to defend us and we get stuck in our heads. And so sometimes the first thing we have to do is to listen and understand where people are coming from. I also do think, and again, this is in addition to everything Josh and Jonathan were saying that I think is so important. We have to look into some of the, um, the racism and the anti-Muslim um, um, feelings that are in the Jewish community, specifically the white Jewish community, that there are, we have our own, not all of us, just like not all of the black community is the same, not all of the Jewish community is the same, but that we have some work to do ourselves, white Jews, to eradicating some of these um, forms of hatred in our own community. And I actually believe not that we deserve anti-Semitism in any way, shape, or form, but again, it's about being good allies. So there's work for us to do as well. Here, here. Allyship is critical. That's the only way. That's the only way forward. So, so actually, building on that, uh, Rabbi Shira, I'm from you first time. Uh, you know, how do you address these kinds of conflicts? You touched on it just for a moment. Like within the Jewish community, within the sixth and I community, there are differing opinions. How do you address that? How do you help to moderate those conversations? Yeah, oof. Um, see, this is such a hard question. I wish I went last on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other two guys. I think it's really hard. It's like, how do you moderate? You might hear my dog Boaz in the background. He's he's very upset about all of these questions. I think that- um, Your dog is Boaz? I know my dog is named Boaz. It's because it's I, like want, naming I, your dog I want George or something. Like. I, it's uh, uh, I wanted to name my son Boaz. My husband's like, you can't name our son Boaz. Name your dog Boaz. I, I, can we talk about this offline? I'm trying hey, to talk. <laughs> you named your son Fluffy, ultimately, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the question, Deb? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no way to begin except to begin, right? Like just sitting and and being frustrated on our couch. Is, is not gonna get us anywhere. Being angry about things that happened 25 years ago is not gonna get us anywhere. I do think we need to build community, 
um, around some of these conversations, build allies, not just meaning in the larger sense, but like even in the Jewish community, and then go out and talk to other people. Um, I think there was something Jonathan said earlier that was, I mean, there's so many things said that were so important, but that no, this is what happens when you go to me first. So I just think the number one thing to do is just to do it. I just think people are, they think that there's someone better. They think that people have imposter syndrome. They think there's something they don't know. They think they're going to get it wrong. Here's, I'm going to tell you something right now. You're going to get it wrong. You're going to get it wrong. And God willing, ultimately, you'll get it right more than you get it wrong. You know, I, I mean, you're sort of disparaging your you went first answer, but I actually think it was so great. I'm going to move on. <laughs> Nice answer. All right. Uh, so, so Jonathan, I'm going to throw this to you and, and Rabbi Shira, Joshua, if you have anything to add, please do. So one of the questions that keeps popping up in, in slightly different uh, variations is, can you talk a little bit about the previous accomplishments of other anti-Semitism envoys and what we are hoping that Dr. Lipstadt will focus on if she is confirmed? Well, I guess there are a couple things to say. First of all, I am not, I don't know exactly what Professor Lipset's agenda is, though I know she's interested in a few issues. Number one, calling out those who delegitimize de the Jewish people under the veneer of, you know, criticizing the Jewish state. So Josh put this, I'm not going to repeat what Josh said earlier so eloquently, but in our view at ADL, anti Zionism is anti Semitism. Whether or not it's intended that way, that ultimately tends to be how it plays out and manifests for Jewish communities. And so I know that we've seen that again and again and again and again and again. And I know that that's important to Professor Lipstadt, number one. Number two, I know she cares deeply about the Holocaust denialism and the kind of the revisionism around fascism that we're seeing in much of Central and Eastern Europe that's been used to marginalize Jews. And by the way, to, as Rabbi Shear was sort of talking about earlier, other minorities. Um, and number three, I think she's got a real intent to focus on calling out hate when it happens here at home too. Even though she's the global envoy, I think she's gonna be focused on the issues we see playing out here with you know, uh, unfortunate predictability in public places and public spaces. And I think that's part of it. You know, we worked with you know, uh, prior uh, anti-Semitic envoys on things like the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. That happened on an earlier one's watch. We had a really interesting conversation with them with the, in process with Ira Foreman when he had the job. And we dealt with, again, the lionizing of uh, Eastern European fascists by some of the new leaders in those countries who are trying to push back on their communist history. And so lionizing people who you know, were involved in the murder of Jews during the Second World War. We worked with Alan Carr's office, the most recent special envoy, on the issue of cyber hate and help them with a large set with a large session that they organized because ADL is probably the organization most focused on fighting hate and harassment, you know, on social media and online more generally. So those are some of the things that we've done that come to mind. And again, I think you'll see Professor Lipstadt build upon that to do to do even more. Great. Uh, all right. Thank you, Jonathan. So we're starting to run low on time. So I've been asked to move to the activism portion of our program. Uh, what'd you say, Jonathan? Very exciting. It, it's, it's very exciting. This, this has never been tried on a fighting hate from home before. So uh, so, so here goes nothing. Live, so demos I've been always, live demos always go well. So I'm sure this is <laughs> Thank you for that, Jonathan. Uh, all right. So today we are going to demonstrate exactly what to do to reach out to your electeds. And I, I've been given the instructions, so I'm going to follow them with all of you watching. All right. So here we go. And one of the things people ask is, are calls actually more effective than emails? And so the answer is emails are great, but sometimes a call is just something that they're going to listen to a little bit more. All right. So here we go. So what we are going to do is we are going to take our phones. And we're going to open up our texts, which I have just done. And we are going to text to the number 528, oops, excuse me, 52886. And I think we're going to put that in the chat. And I'm going to text the word envoy. All right, see, I've done that. Uh, and, and you can also see that this is not the first time I've had an, I've done an action for ADL. Okay, so I've texted. 
Can I just oh, say while you're doing that, like yes. how much I appreciate, you know, while I'm talking about Deborah Lipstadt, we are fortunate that the office is still doing work now. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Aaron Kiak, who's the acting special envoy, and who'll be working with Professor Lipstadt once, you know, God willing, she's uh, confirmed. Aaron Kiak is doing a great job in making sure that even in Professor Lipstadt's absence, that state is still doing so much. So I just want to make sure I give a shout out to him. It would be a miss if I didn't do that. Thank you, Jonathan. I think that was a worthwhile pause. All right. So, so I have texted Envoy to 52886, and it sent me, sent me back a message. You can see it right there. It says, click here to tell your senators to confirm Dr. Deborah Lipstadt. And I click on the link, and then it opens with my slow Wi-Fi in the office. There we go. Uh, an action page at ADL, and it shows me how to enter my address and my zip code. All right, so I'm gonna cheat on this part a little bit. Not that I don't want all of you to know exactly where I live, but all right. And so I am going to be calling Senator Gillibrand from New York. And so I'm gonna close out of that and I am going to open up my phone app. You can see there it is, and there is the number. All right, and now I'm gonna call. It's ringing. So far, no one has picked up, but I'm ready because I have a whole script that is given to me when I click on that link. All right, still ringing. Must be busy over at the Senator's office today. All right, I've gotten the machine. Oh, I guess uh, I guess that shows my age. I got the voicemail. Yeah, there's, there's no machine. <laughs> All right. Hi. I wanted to tell the senator how I feel about an issue that's coming up. I'm going to give you my zip code. It's I'm going to give it for the office. It's 10158. And I'm calling about the nomination of Dr. Deborah Lipstadt to be the envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Dr. Lipstadt is superbly qualified for this position, which is becoming more and more important as anti-Semitic incidents here and abroad become more frequent. This is a critical position which has been left empty too long. I am a volunteer with the Anti-Defamation League, and I am urging the senator to vote yes to confirm Dr. Lipstadt. Thank you very much. All right, was anyone timing that? That was quick. That was easy. It was really very painless. I even well did done, it on Deb. live well webinar. Done. All well right, done. thank you. Thank you. It felt good to take action. All right, so I, just, before I think pushing all of our people to do this, if I might, that's kind of a chutz push. <laughs> Let's push. Right. I think this is a new coin term you guys can use now for advocacy off of the chutzpah. Let's trademark. Push. Trademark. Take it. Take it. Trademark. There it is. There it is. All right. I've already registered the domain, Josh. So, and I've got the Twitter handle. I'm on it. Let's push. All right. Uh, and I'm told if you do not have a smartphone, you can look up the senator's webpage and the number will be there and you can call. Also, your ADL regional office can help. And all of that information is available at ADL.org. So before we say goodbye, I'm, I'm going to give each of our panelists a quick opportunity just to, I think, maybe give us something to be hopeful for. We, we talk a lot about anti-Semitism and about how tough things are. So Jonathan, I'm going to start with you. Give us something to be hopeful for. Look, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who believes in American exceptionalism. I think this, this democracy is the most vibrant in human history. And I think its resilience gives me great hope. And I think if we roll up our sleeves and engage in the process, there's nothing we can't do. Thank you. All right, Rabbi Shira. I think Jews are organized. I think we are organized. I think we have great leadership. I think this is one moment in, with, in when the fact that 75% of non-Orthodox Jews are married to non-Jews in our country right now is a benefit and a blessing because the number of people who are part of the extended Jewish community is wider than ever. And we really can make change if we set our mind to it. All right, thank you. All right, Josh, over to you. I'm left with hope uh, just for from the past hour, if I've looked like I've been looking off screen, I, I haven't been watching television, I've been looking at the chat box and it has gone 
nonstop with, I can't tell you how many different people have had something to say and something hopeful and something helpful. And so I think if we consider this kind of an early Kol Nidre appeal, we should all make a pledge, an activism pledge. When this quits, when we end this session, I'm going to do what I just learned to do. I'm going to text uh, Envoy to five, 886, 52886, and I am going to make that call. And it, it it doesn't feel super comfortable to do, but what's easier than just sharing an opinion? So I, I hope we will all actually follow through. We're, we're saying great things in the box. We've said things to each other. Let's empower each other and let's actually have the follow through to do it. And I think that that's a hopeful act that we can all engage in. I, I love that. Say, this is like so awesome. Like Josh, you are the most Yiddish kite, like Hollywood type I've ever seen. And you know, we, I remember growing up, my dad used to watch the, much to the chagrin of me and my brother, the Jerry Lewis telethon. We should yeah. do a chutzathon right here, right now. This is the start of it. And Josh, like, I want you as the host. I don't know if we can <laughs> we'll afford, talk. We'll talk. I don't know if we can afford you, but I'm telling <laughs> you. I think we should put Josh on the view if you ask me. <laughs> I should have asked for that. <laughs> That's a tough sell. <laughs> thanks for having us but a worthy ask certainly all right well i want to thank all of you for being here today and i certainly want to thank our panelists and i want to encourage everybody out there to find download and listen to chutzpah it can be found i'm pretty sure wherever you find any of your favorite podcasts uh, and I see that people are asking for the information. Don't worry, we're going to send it to you again via email along with a recording of this webinar so that you can watch it again and again and share it with all of your friends. But as one more reminder, you're going to text ENVOY, E-N-V-O-Y, to the number 52886, and that's going to give you the link to call your senator. Awesome. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of your activism. And remember, our Fighting Hate from Home series will continue next month. So keep an eye on your inbox for the next topic and registration information. Until then, stay safe and continue to be well.